another abstract that was presented in the oral session um, was looking at the combination of ibrutinib and a new anti-CD20 monoclonal called ublituximab. And it was a randomized trial. Initially, was intended to accrue over 300 patients, and it was a very interesting design because they actually had an SPA from the FDA such that after all the patients were enrolled, they could look at response rate, either ibrutinib alone or ibrutinib plus ublituximab, and if the response rate was significantly better with the combination, that could actually serve as the basis for an accelerated approval, with then the longer follow-up for PFS then serving as the confirmatory uh, endpoint for the full approval. It's actually the first time I've ever seen a trial w which had a, an accelerated and a confirmed endpoint in, in the same trial. Actually, what happened is that trial, which was only for high-risk patients, so relapsed 11Q or 17P, had some difficulty accruing. And it would beca became clear that it would take a really long time to accrue the necessary over 300 patients. So the trial was then um, taken back to the drawing board. The PFS endpoint was dropped as the co-primary endpoint, and, and there was the primary endpoint is just response, and there are a uh, little over 100 patients. And what it showed is that the response rate to the combination was significantly greater than the response rate to ibrutinib. However, we know that the initial responses we see with ibrutinib or any single agent B-cell receptor inhibitor are what we call PRLs, because we know that we get that shrinkage of the lymph nodes and then the lymphocytes efflux into the peripheral blood and we expect the lymphocyte count to actually go up. So by standard PR criteria, even if the nodes have shrunk 80, 90%, if that peak in the lymphocyte count is not 50% below the baseline, we can't call them PRs. That's why you sometimes see them called PRLs. And we know that that is the pattern, the primary pattern of response. About 80% of relapsed patients will have that pattern of response with ibrutinib. So I think the question that was raised by this trial was, yes, you get a more rapid response when you add the antibody because you abrogate the lymphocytosis, but in the long run, will it prove to have a more durable effect such as on CR rate or, or PFS? They had some preliminary PFS data where uh, it did look like the combination arm might be a little bit better, but it really was too early and it was not statistically significant. So I think that that's interesting data, but we already knew from prior trial done at MD Anderson combining ibrutinib with rituximab that you get much faster responses when you add the antibody, again, because you abrogate the lymphocytosis. That trial didn't clearly show a long-term benefit, although there is a randomized trial being done at MD Anderson now in relapse of ibrutinib plus or minus uh, rituximab. So same sort of idea. And that maybe we'll give a clear answer, at least for rituximab, as to whether the antibody really adds. So this was interesting data with a novel antibody, but I think um, can't make a lot of conclusions from that. The third uh, and final CLL abstract that was presented was presented on Richter syndrome in, in, the, in the current age, if you will, Richter syndrome developing on patients on oral agents. And it was about 10 centers that got together and pooled their data was presented by Matt Davids from Dana-Farber, and they looked at all of their Richters um, since the advent of, of small molecule therapy, so ibrutinib, idelalisib, venetoclax, some, also some of the patients that had investigational next generation uh, agents to be cell receptor inhibitors or PI3K inhibitors. And what they showed was something that has pretty much been known, but not never a, such a large group of patients put together to really make the data robust, which is that, um, these patients have very high-risk abnormalities, complex karyotypes, deletion 17P, unmutated, notch mutations, et cetera. So they're a very high-risk population. The average time to development of Richter's after the novel agent was about nine months, although, again, these are all relapsed patients, not frontline. And the outcomes were terrible. The survival was in the order of months. Most patients were treated with a typical large cell lymphoma regimen, so RCHOP, REPOC, et cetera. But the overall response rate's about 40-something percent, the vast majority of them being PRs. In fact, the, there's a very low CR rate of about 10, 15 percent. And then the two long-term survivors were patients they were actually able to get to allogeneic stem cell transplant. So the point was made that this is just a, still in CLL where we have all these great new drugs, a really dire unmet medical need because these patients, once they do transform, have just a terrible outcome. And there's some preliminary data, interestingly, that the checkpoint inhibitors may have activity. 
um, in, in the Richter's. Interestingly, they don't seem to have much activity in CLL, but in the large cell component, there was a paper published from Mayo showing some activity, and Dr. Jane from MD Anderson presented some MD Anderson data using a combination of ibrutinib and a checkpoint inhibitor for Richter's at the last ASH. So there's maybe a glimmer of hope that the checkpoint inhibitors may have a role there. Uh, but this is still, I would say, a, a definite unmet medical need in CLL.